what sits at the core of author Roshni Chokshi's several middle grade and young adult fantasy novels? A few things, actually. A well-rounded and layered depiction of marginalized characters. An exploration of new worlds often rooted in or inspired by the mythology of real cultures. And moreover, a complex and impactful story that captivates readers. A St. Louis-born New York Times best-selling author, Roshni Chakshi, is a powerful writer that's been inspiring young minds for the past five years. I got the chance to speak with her about her captivating book, The Bronzed Beasts, the latest in her Gilded Wolves fantasy series. We also talk about developing meaningful characters of color in a world where minority voices are often reduced or misrepresented. One of the biggest challenges of being an author of color in this industry is that we have to constantly remind everybody that people of color are not a monolith. And her favorite and least favorite parts of writing a book in a larger series. But I think the first books are the hardest because you're trying to explain the rules of the world, give a roadmap, and um, hopefully do it in such a way that you're not overwhelming a reader, but instead ensnaring them in a brand new world. Her humor and talent are obvious within the first moments of our conversation, but the reward of her writing is best experienced on the page. I'm Sandra Salib, a student at Ladue High School studying journalism. On behalf of St. Louis County Library and HEC Media, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with best-selling young adult and middle grade author Roshni Chakshi. Roshni, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Today we'll be talking about the new book in Roshni's popular Gilded Wolves fantasy series, The Bronze Beasts. You can order your copy of The Bronze Beasts from our indie bookstore partner, The Novel Neighbor. The Gilded Wolf series is such a uniquely diverse book series, whether that be through the characters that are developed or through the plot twists that I never see coming. Tell me about how you first imagined the Gilded Wolves world. So this is going to sound make me sound extremely uh, ridiculous, but I feel like that's pretty par for the course when uh, people get to know me. So the Gilded Wolves honestly started uh, because I really like National Treasure. I really, that is my comfort show. It is so bad that it just transcends all artistic integrity and becomes sacred in my mind. Um, when I was a kid and watching National Treasure, I don't know why, maybe it's just some sort of like, eh, Nicolas Cage, interesting, like fascinated by him as an artist, but also somewhat recoil <laughs> like, when I watch his movies. And, um, I knew, you know, when I started thinking about what I was going to write after I'd finished The Star Touch Queen and A Crown of Wishes, I, I remember I was sick one day and I was in bed and I was watching National Treasure. And I just thought to myself, this is going to be so fun. I'm going to write something that is just a treasure hunt with riddles because I love riddles. I'm going to set it in 19th century Paris because I love Paris. And I just love the idea of Belle Epoque France. You know, like to me, it was going to be all Moulin Rouge and girls wearing strings of pearls and like endless platters of champagne and all these sorts of things. And then it all sort of fell apart from there. Everything fell apart because the problem is once you start with a kernel of an idea, then you have to scratch at it and just be like, all right, well, okay, let's say I'm going to set this book in 1889. What the heck was happening in 1889? And when people think about the imagery of Paris, one of the first thing that comes to mind is always the Eiffel Tower. Uh, one thing that I learned was that the Eiffel Tower was actually built uh, to serve as the entrance to the 1889 Exposition Universelle, the World Fair. And this was an exciting time. Like people are showing off their cool new technological innovations, all that kind of stuff. However, uh, at that time, the biggest attraction of the Exposition Universelle was a human zoo, which is as horrible as it sounds. It drew 28 million visitors and it was African natives on display. And the entire point of it was to celebrate Europe's civilizing mission. They were just like, look at all like the, the sophistication and culture and elegance that we are bringing to quote unquote primitive societies. And the Exposition Universelle was not alone in that. Uh, the London World Fair, it had, I think, indigenous 
people from the Indian subcontinent. The St. Louis World Fair actually had the Igorot people on display, which were um, indigenous groups of the Philippines. And my mother is from the Philippines. And so all of a sudden, the story that had started off as something that was just supposed to be lighthearted ended up becoming me interrogating the fact that I am absolutely a product of colonialism. My father is from India. My mother is from the Philippines. I became curious about how objects got into museums and who put them there. And there can still be all the fun treasure hunting aspects and riddles and puzzles, but it gives us this greater question about history and who gets to write it. And that's kind of how the Gilded Wolves went from a very, very silly, happy idea to something that essentially became an existential crisis wrapped in a, I don't know, Book of Job fan fiction with some Faustian twist thrown in there. It's been a hard couple of years. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about the, the setting of your book, this pre-World yeah. War II setting. What inspired you to choose that? I think, you know, it's just the glamour of the period. When I was growing up and I would think about La Belle Epoque, I mean, I was thinking about these beautiful Toulouse-Lautrec prints. I was thinking about the age of courtesans and chorus girls, the Folie Bergere, um, you know, just shows that to me were the height of sophistication and, and elegance. I was also a really huge fan of Moulin Rouge and I was growing up and I loved the music and I loved just how decadent that time period felt. I felt as if we've only moved farther and farther away from that level of beauty. And yet what I also love about that setting, and it's part of the reason why uh, the first book is called The Gilded Wolves, is because that layer of gold that we see on it is a very, very thin layer. While we have the Belle Epoque in one hand, we also have an age of imperialism. We have an age where anti-Semitism was on the rise. Jewish pogroms were, you know, this was just starting to happen at the, the fringes of the Russian empire and things were only going to get worse. And simultaneously there, there's jewels strewn among this, you know, there's, there's diamonds of industry and art and literature, but it is, it sits amidst filth, frankly, and a lot of terrible things. One of my favorite things about the series is how you were able to write about the different races of the characters and how they play in their interactions with white French society. Can you tell me more about how you were able to do that and the very conscious choices you made regarding the diversity of the core group of characters? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've hit this point in my career, which is an exciting thing to say. Like, I, I have a career. I have like I have tons of books now, et cetera, well, anyway, that kind of thing. But the point is, <laughs> um, and diversity was never a conscientious thought for me. Like I wasn't thinking to myself, I really want to stick it to the man or something. I was operating from an extremely delightfully selfish point of view, which is where would I be in this story? If I was existing at this time, what would I be doing? What would people like me, how would we be operating? Um, uh, and also, you know, I am mixed race. And although I'm not white passing, I have friends who are mixed race and are white passing. And there's a lot of different conversations to be had about privilege, what you look like, how you're perceived, how much money you grew up with. All of these things can lubricate the wheels of society and let you be in places that perhaps society tells you uh, there is no room for you. So when I started thinking about the cast and the characters that would be in the world of the Gilded Wolves, I knew that I would inevitably have something in common with them. And at the same time, I wrote outside of my lived experience, um, you know, with characters like Zofia, who is, um, I had written her to be on the autism spectrum. And she's also Jewish or Hypnos, who is black um, and Enrique, who's bisexual. Those things, to me, I think the worst thing that an author can do is just tack on a sort of checklist of diversity. I'm like, well, here's how we make this person different. Here's how we try to make something on trend, which is just terrible. I mean, the whole point of it was for me to reflect um, my own life, the people who are in my life, people that I love. And to do that, I really was thankful and I was really, really grateful to rely on the expertise of other people. Um, I worked with a lot of sensitivity readers. I was really, really, really fortunate in working with editors who would point me in the right direction to different kinds of primary sources. And in that way, I felt that I had at least accumulated enough information to 
um, if not write them perfectly, to, to do the best job that I could. And I think that one of the beauties of writing an ensemble cast is that everybody has equal weight. Everybody has equal stake in the story itself. I don't think that I would feel comfortable if I had, you know, only one main character who was so different from me. Like I would not feel comfortable writing a Jewish main character and passing off an entire book as if this is, you know, my expertise. Um, but to be able to split the book into different perspectives to say for a little bit, I'm going to use this spotlight and use what I know and use the expertise of other people. I felt, I felt comfortable enough to do that at least. Um, your books are inclusive of so many different races, cultures, and religions, and they do an amazing job of making the reader really feel seen. How did you balance your want to include so much diversity with making sure that each character's experience was realistically represented? I don't think that we should treat inclusivity or diversity as icing on the cake of a story. I think that it has to be authentic to the story itself. For example, um, the time in which Enrique is existing in 1889, and he's of Spanish and Filipino descent. This is during the time that Spain controlled the Philippines. Um, that it meant that for him to be Spanish and Filipino, it made him both a product of his world and it also impacted his perspective on how he moved through the world. Uh, it wasn't something that I just wanted to throw on there and ignore. It needed to be an identity that had that was engaged with. And that was really, really important for all of the characters. Um, it's the thing that influenced, you know, part of their, uh, I guess, desire to work together because they all got something out of it, right? They're, they're trying to understand themselves. They're trying to understand where they belong in 19th century society. And so all those questions about their, their you know, religious identity, their ethnic identity, um, and even their socioeconomic status, all of that uh, held weight in the world. And so to me, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just icing on the cake. It was something that they very much had to grapple with over the course of three books. So Sophia is such an interesting character as you were talking about. Can you tell me more about uh, what we can look forward to from her in the next book? Yes, uh, I really, really loved writing Zofia. I think that she she kind of steals every scene that she's in, in a lot of ways like Hypnos too. He really wasn't supposed to like become a core member of the group. But when I started writing him in The Gilded Wolves, he was just so much fun. And he just insisted on being there that I was like, well, I, I don't have a choice, I guess. I, I guess you're in it for the long haul. <laughs> um, but for Zofia, I think the biggest part about her journey is one of bravery. And what does it mean to be brave? Especially for someone like her who processes the world differently from other people. This is something that's given her a lot of anxiety. It makes her feel out of place at times. It makes her feel frightened about making the wrong move. And yet she has so much to offer the world. And it's a lot about her realizing all the things that she can do. So that's something I'm really looking forward to, to people reading in the Bronze to Beast. You're also the author of the very popular Aru Shaw series for middle grade readers. The series is part of the Rick Riordan Presents imprint that highlights world mythologies and folklore. Can you tell us about the mythology behind the Aru Shaw books? Yeah, it's uh, entirely inspired by Hindu mythology. Um, you know, it's so interesting that you that you ask about mythology because I had a wonderful conversation with something someone about this a while ago uh, in the sense that mythology has two very competing definitions. On the one hand, people think of mythology as a widely held uh, set of false beliefs. And on the other hand, there's the definition of mythology as uh, cultural tradition, a piece of cultural tradition. And that latter uh, definition is very much how I look at Hindu mythology, right? I think maybe some people may think it's more appropriate to call Arusha a retelling of a Hindu epic, um, in large part because I don't want to suggest that our mythology is something false or outdated. Hinduism is very much a alive religion, and it's one that I practice. Um, 
And so it's a really, really interesting thing when the stories and the epics and the legends are deeply intertwined with the sacred. And it posed a lot of it posed a lot of interesting challenges for me to figure out how to talk about something, um, how to not how to not step toes on the sacred and, you know, people, your mileage may vary on, on whether you think I did a good job of that or not. But at the end of the day, um, I had to make myself happy. I had to explore the questions that I had always found interesting from a young age and also revisit the stories that my grandmother and my aunts and uncles had told me from a very, very young age and, um, and interact with them because I, I don't think that mythology or legends are dead things. I think they're very much alive. And in the retelling of them, we update them to reflect our, our societal norms, the things that we're thinking about. Are, they're, they're like mirrors. So it's been very, very fun to write the Arusha series. You were the first author to be selected for the Rick Riordan series. What has it been like to work with him on these books? so much fun. Rick is one of my favorite human beings. Um, you know, he, he really lent a wonderful editorial eye to the first two books. So actually he only edited the first two books. And then after that, he was like, it's all you, <laughs> I'm losing the reins. It's all you. And that was, that's been extremely, extremely rewarding. I mean, he's obviously a titan in the children's book industry. And so to get his opinion on how a story is moving, how he would approach something, um, how to make a person turn the pages of a book, there's so many things to learn from. And I think one of the most rewarding things about it is that the Rick Riordan Presents imprint honestly feels like a family. We all we like we all follow each other on social media. When we get to hang out pre-COVID, we have a blast. We like cackle our way through all of the panels. Um, and I've become super, super close to another one of the authors on the Rick Riordan Presents uh, imprint line. And that's Jen Cervantes, who wrote The Storm Runner, like to the point where I send her pictures of new duvets that I'm going to buy and ask her if she thinks it fits with my bedroom decor, like kind of thing. <laughs> So what's next for Arusha? Well, the Arusha series is coming to an end on April 7th, 2022. So yeah, this is like, I am wrapping up both series that have lived in my heart and destroyed my hands over the course of five, five, six years or so that they've, that they've all just been living in my head. And it's so, so weird to come to the end of everything just to, to be at the end of it all. Yeah, can you tell me more about that? How you're feeling about the end of both series? Strange, you know, like on, on the one hand, there's days where I'm extremely proud and I'm just like, wow, I did it. I wrote like 10 books, I am extremely tired. And then there are days where, you know, sometimes, especially as an author of color, uh, there are hard days with what we do. One of the biggest challenges of being an author of color in this industry is that we have to constantly remind everybody that people of color are not a monolith, that stories that I'm telling may not reflect your lived experience. And that is not exactly the grounds uh, to cancel someone, but to say that we are trying to make room for other people at the table. That's the greatest gift that I've been given, that these stories have been able to find some mainstream appeal and also sort of prove in a sense that you don't have to be of that cultural background to appreciate a story. Kids don't think about stories that way. They just look at it as this is really fun and I'm learning something new. I like monsters, the end. They're not thinking about like all these other, um, issues that perhaps adults project onto these stories. And so, so that's been extremely rewarding. You know, I, I'm really, really grateful that I get to do this. And then at the same time, I, I think that there's, there's a great deal of having to make peace with the unknown, both in life and especially in art. We have no idea what's going to last. I have no idea what's going to stick. Uh, I know that my copyright will certainly I don't know. I mean, it'll outlive me and that's pretty cool, uh, but I have no idea what will happen after that. And, um, and that's like the wonderful and sort of tragic thing about writing. We pour our hearts and souls into a story and the minute that we're done writing them, they cease to belong to us. Instead, they belong to you guys. And I can only hope that they find a home in your heart, but I have no control over it. 
Um, with the widening magical world of your books, are there any hidden secrets that only a few people will find? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's no surprise. I like to troll both my readers and myself. So there are a couple how I met your mother jokes in the bronze beast. There is a one tiny crossover paragraph uh, that links the Gilded Wolves and Arusha. And uh, maybe only a couple people have found it in Arusha in the City of Gold. Um, there's a couple Mean Girls jokes thrown into the Gilded Wolves. There's just a bunch of things that essentially made me laugh and that I hope make you laugh. But, uh, but yeah, it requires a bit of a, it requires a bit of an, an eagle eyed reader and also someone to ask like, did she really do that? Is that author this unhinged? And the answer is yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> Um, do you find it more challenging to write the first book in a series or to write the subsequent novels? Oh my gosh, absolutely the first book. I hate it. I hate it so much. In fact, I think ugh, sometimes I wish I could go back in time and rewrite the beginning of The Gilded Wolves because I gave it my best shot to try to lay down the world building and tell you a little about the time and tell you a little about everybody and then just be like, whew, got all that? All right, let's go on an adventure. And there are so many ways in which you can lose a reader by doing that. And I really hope I didn't lose anyone. Or if I did lose you, I hope that perhaps uh, people's opinions about the end of the trilogy make you think, well, all right, I'll go back and I'll give this thing another shot. Um, but I think the first books are the hardest because you're trying to explain the rules of the world. You're trying to get across your character's wants, needs, fears, all that kind of stuff. You're trying to give them a goal, give a roadmap, and um, hopefully do it in such a way that you're not overwhelming a reader, but instead ensnaring them in a brand new world. Are any of your characters based on people you know in real life? Absolutely. Yeah. People I hate uh, automatically end up as monsters. Okay. <laughs> um <laughs> Am I kidding? I don't know. It depends. If you are someone I hate and you read this book and you find yourself in it, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I will say that, I, of course, I think there's something, it's almost impossible not to put yourself in your own stories. The, it has to have that, well, at least for me, it has to have this level of wish fulfillment. It has to be something that I uh, innately connect with because I can see pieces of either my greatest desires, my deepest fears, um, tragedies, hopes, achievements, all that kind of stuff in the stories. And um, and yeah, however, I will say that the only character who is perhaps autobiographical is a flesh-eating demon horse and the star touch queen and her name is Kamala. And she is absolutely me because I couldn't figure out what I would be doing in a fantasy book. I thought, you know, if I was the villain, that just takes a lot of work and a lot of tragedy that can't be good for your complexion. And if I'm the main character, I mean, someone's just going to be trying to kill me the whole time. This isn't going to be fun for like 90% of the experience. So I would rather just be a chaotic neutral demon, just off, you know, off the sides of the plot, just wondering when we're all going to eat. And that's pretty much my contribution to the story. Interesting choice. <laughs> choice. <laughs> so what can readers look forward to in your next book? In the bronze piece. Okay, here's what you can look forward to. You can look forward to getting to know Venice and wandering through the city and the canals and the lagoons, but not really wandering them because we all know that they're full of human excrement and that's not cool. Uh, masquerades, more riddles, more legends, and also an ending that I have been working towards for the past or five years or so. I, I've always known the last line of the series and it's incredible because I've just been working towards it all this time. And when I finally got to write it, I mean, I just bawled my eyes out. So I, I hope that it is um, as emotionally moving for you as it was for me. With this piece of you, this piece of you that you've put into this series almost done, how are you, how, what are you gonna do next? What are you planning on doing? Mm, well, I've, I've been doing things. However, of course, I mean, I can't talk about it. It's the most annoying thing about, I know, don't you hate it when authors like we go online? Or, so here's the thing. I mean, I really do it just out of vanity. If I got a blowout that day, I am absolutely going on Instagram to say, guys, I just got some really great news, but I can't tell you about it yet. It's a secret. <laughs> And I do that. And sometimes I have a secret. Sometimes I don't, <laughs> but I just want to say it. But the truth is that I do have a secret and I can't tell you about it. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> um, but it's, it's going to be really different. You know, I've been in the children's uh, book world for 
a long time. And although I have, I mean, I'm, I co-wrote a Halloween rom-com with two of my close author friends, Evelyn Sky and Sandhya Menon. It's called Three Kisses, One Midnight. It's going to come out next fall. Um, but that's, that's my last YA book. Um, and I actually am not sure what else I may have to say in that world. But there are other stories that have been calling to me terrible bloodstained things that come from deep, dark, dusty corners of my imagination and subconscious. And I suppose this is, was the time that they wanted to come out and so they've come out. So expect something uh, a little darker. Awesome, thank you so much for being on this interview with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Don't forget to get your copy of The Bronze Beast from our indie bookstore partner, The Novel Neighbor. When Kahina could trust herself to speak, and it took longer than she thought, for it seemed the Arabic she knew kept slipping off her tongue, she croaked, what was that? A vision granted to the blessed so that we might understand our sacred duty, said her mother. We have other names, I am told, for our family scattered long ago, where the lost muses, the Norns, the daughters of Bethala, the silent obstress. The instrument you saw holds many names and many tongues, but its function is always the same. When played, it disrupts the divine. The divine, repeated Kahina. It felt too small a word given what she had seen. My mother spoke of a place built from the ruins of a land whose sacred group misused its power. Played outside the confines of that stained temple, the instrument will unleash a destruction that levels the world, said Kahina's mother. Played within the temple, it is said to join all those slivers of divinity you glimpsed. Some say that it can be raised into a tower which one may scale like a building and claim godhood for themselves. It is not for us to know. Our duty is laid out in one command. Her mother held out her hand, hoisting Kahina to her feet. In your hands lie the gates of godhood. Let none pass. Mm -hmm.